In today's video, I have a very special guest with us, Dr. Anna Lemke. She's the author of the book, Dopamine Nation, a New York Times and LA Times bestseller. She's a physician of psychiatry and happens to be the head of Stanford Addiction Medicine Clinics or Centers. Dr. Lemke, thank you so much for being here today with us. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. Before we get started, I just want to thank you so much for writing that book, Dopamine Nation. Of all the books I have read on addiction, yours walked me through examples of real life individuals who were struggling with addiction. You provided me with an education of exactly what was happening in my brain. You gave me tools and real time solutions or things that I could use to help manage my own struggles with addiction. And then you left me with expectations going forward when it came to kind of that recovery and sobriety side of things. So I really want to thank you for such a, a well laid out book and putting this out there for the world to read. Um, anyone listening to this, if you don't make it through the whole thing, please pick up a copy of this book. It will, it will serve you good. So thank you for that, Dr. Lumpke. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for uh, reading the book. And thank you for those uh, very kind words. It, it makes me feel really good. Um, Dr. Lumpke, I want to start and I want to keep today's focus on cannabis addiction. I know that this is an area that you have a lot of familiarity with. You often describe uh, patients that you've worked with as your heroes. And you've described people who have gone through addiction and gone through the recovery process as people with almost like superpowers and a certain level of wisdom that other people don't have. And being someone myself who's been in recovery from things and struggled with addiction, this really struck a chord in a really, really good way with me because I always felt this way, but this isn't often how you hear people who struggle with addiction being spoken of. What do you mean by that? Could you like elaborate on that? Oh, sure. Uh, first of all, I mean, my, my, my patients are amazing people. You know, what they've done to get into recovery and the way that their lives have been transformed through their courage and tenacity to walk that very difficult road is just so awe inspiring. And the way that they've helped the people around them um, by, you know, doing the hard work of recovery, um, they're just incredible people. So, and I've learned so much from them. You know, I've learned so many nuggets of wisdom that I've incorporated in my own personal life, in my family life, and in my marriage. Uh, so I'm just really grateful uh, to the whole sort of recovery community. And what I mean when I talk about people in recovery being uh, modern day prophets for the rest of us is to say that we really are living in this uh, drugified world where we've all become vulnerable to the problem of addiction. People uh, with severe addiction and recovery are people who have had to figure out how to navigate this dopamine overloaded world as a matter of life and death. They didn't have an option, right? They were either going to figure it out or they weren't going to make it. And as such, they have a lot of hard work, hard earned wisdom for the rest of us uh, who are all, I think, you know, struggling to varying degrees with all kinds of uh, little, uh, little addictions. I couldn't agree more with that. Um, how would you define addiction? Because we're going to be talking a lot today about cannabis and a lot of people say, oh, you can't, I get this all the time on my channels. You can't get addicted to weed. That's impossible you're lying, you weren't addicted to weed. How, how would you define addiction? Addiction, broadly speaking, is the continued compulsive use of a substance or behavior despite harm to self and or others. Uh, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is sort of our psychiatric Bible, um, has 11 criteria that can broadly be encompassed by the four C's, control, compulsion, craving and consequences. In other words, these are psychological and behavioral manifestations of a, a consumptive pattern that's harmful to the individual, harmful to other people, and is continued uh, despite that harm and which people stop with difficulty. Importantly, in that uh, criteria is nothing about quantity or frequency. But that doesn't mean that quantity and frequency don't matter. They do matter. The more people use of any drug, the more likely they are to get addicted to that drug. 
The reason that the DSM or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders doesn't have quantity and frequency is because the people who wrote it, which was a bunch of psychiatrists sitting around a table, wanted a unifying definition that they could use for all different ty types of addictive substances. And, and therefore, they didn't limit it to quantity and frequency. Plus, we don't have good data on how much is too much, except for alcohol, where we do have pretty good data. It's fascinating that you brought up the standpoint of quantity. Uh, a lot of people, when I share my story, or even people who reach out to our offices, are surprised to hear that I only consumed cannabis during the evening hours. I wasn't someone who was smoking from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. But even that amount of consumption was enough to significantly di disrupt multiple aspects of my life. So I think it's, oh, I think it's wonderful that you brought up the quantity thing. Because I, I, a lot of times I think people fall for the perception, oh, okay. if I'm not doing this all day long or if I'm not smoking cannabis all day long, I can't possibly be addicted. It can't possibly be that big of a deal when maybe they are suffering consequences from it and just kind of putting it aside. So people can get addicted to cannabis then, right? There's a physiological pathway for this. This can happen. Absolutely. So uh, it is well documented, both in clinical observation, in epidemiologic studies, in brain studies, that cannabis is an addictive substance and that people do get addicted to cannabis. Um, the data right now show that approximately 9% of individuals who use cannabis will get addicted to cannabis. And this is consistent with other drugs, which roughly wavers between about 5 and 10% a lifetime prevalence for um, all drug use disorders. So, uh, you know, there's absolutely, it's addictive for uh, some individuals, uh, about one in 10. Um, and that the idea or the myth that, you know, it's not addictive because there's not, for example, a life-threatening intoxication or withdrawal state for the vast majority of people uh, does not mean that it's not addictive, right? You can you can be addicted to something and not experience withdrawal uh, necessarily when you stop it, especially physical withdrawal. And the universal sim symptoms of withdrawal from any addictive substance are not physical, they're psychological, anxiety, irritability, insomnia, dysphoria, and craving. So whenever I have patients who are using cannabis um, in an addictive way, and usually that's a daily consumption, daily use is often a very, a strong marker for addictive use. Um, you know, I always remind them, well, you know, when you try to stop, do you experience increased anxiety, increased dysphoria, increased uh, difficulty concentrating, intrusive thoughts of wanting to use your drug? It doesn't just have to be, you know, some kind of life-threatening withdrawal. It's interesting too, you bring up uh, upon quitting cannabis, do you experience increased anxiety, increased intrusive thoughts? A lot of times when I would smoke weed, I was under the impression that it was curing my anxiety, curing the depression, that it was actually aiding in it. And then when I would quit, temporarily, I would experience withdrawal symptoms of heightened anxiety more than I was even aware of before. I would smoke and suddenly I'd say, oh, see, the anxiety is going away. I think I was stuck in that cycle of addiction, though, um, where it wasn't actually treating the anxiety per se in my case. I know I know there's medicinal benefit for some people, but interesting that you brought that up. Well, actually, um, let me interject there, because if you, if you look at the evidence uh, that we have for cannabis, there's no reliable evidence that cannabis helps with any psychiatric condition or disorder. Zero, zero. What there is evidence for is that for short in short term studies, these are studies lasting on average two weeks or less. Cannabis can be helpful for pain, for spasticity, for AIDS induced uh, anorexia or chemotherapy induced anorexia. So the 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 subset of um, you know indications, medical indications uh, for which we actually have evidence are very very small and they're very short term. Um, so I just think it's really important to remember that there are a lot of people report that that there's medicinal benefit, but there's no evidence that there's medicinal benefit for psychiatric disorders. Furthermore, as, as you discuss, there's um, mounting evidence that uh, regular cannabis use actually can make psychiatric conditions worse over time. And the reason that people feel subjective relief short term is because initially, you know, anything that releases dopamine makes people feel better.
But over time, when people get relief after they become physically dependent and addictive, they're not getting relief for the underlying anxiety or depression. What they are is they're medicating withdrawal from their last dose. Dr. Anna Lemke, you just blew my mind with that. And I want to touch on pain because outside of being an addiction recovery coach, I'm a chiropractor as well too. And I'm starting to see here in New York, we have legalized uh, medicinal cannabis, which I I have nothing against, fine. But I am starting to pick up on a trend, I think. And I wonder this with any substances. I believe there's the same thing with opioids. If someone abuses opioids chronically, does it not lead to more pain? And I mean physical pain. I'm not talking necessarily about the pain of addiction, but something that occurs within our dopamine pathways. And I know we're going to touch on this more later, but why not right now? Where is if we constantly lean into pleasure, so consuming a drug, trying to get that pleasure, you talk about this pain balance and you say, actually, we, we wind up tipping more to pain the more we seek pleasure. Do you think there's something happening there with chronic cannabis use and, and maybe pain perception? Uh, I, I, yes. I think drawing a parallel to opioids is very um, apt. Um, and you're absolutely right with uh, people who take opioids prescribed by a doctor for uh, daily regular use, especially at high doses, can develop something called opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Hyper means more, algesia means uh, pain. Um, And essentially what they're experiencing is increased pain as a result of taking opioids, not only in the part of their body where they had the original pain condition, but in other parts of their body where they previously didn't have any pain at all. And the way that we believe that that's happening is that chronic use essentially resets pain thresholds. Um, you know, through this process of neuroadaptation, which is also what leads to addiction. So uh, absolutely, that's probably um, what's happening also potentially with cannabis used for pain long term. What the data show is that people with chronic pain who uh, use cannabis for their chronic pain uh, do not have a more pain release relief than people who don't use cannabis and may even have worse states of pain over time. And so this is, these data are coming out, right? People with chronic pain who use cannabis, if you look at the, their metrics for pain, they're in more discomfort than people who don't use cannabis for pain. And again, I want to emphasize here that short term, the data are reliable that cannabis helps with pain. We're talking about two weeks. That's how long these studies are, two weeks. So if I gave a person with pain cannabis or they smoked cannabis that they got on their own and they came and endorsed pain relief, I would be like, yep, that makes sense. That's consistent with the evidence. The problem is that beyond about two to four weeks, the brain adapts, that substance stops working, whether it's cannabis or opioids, we need more and more to get the same effect. Now we're chasing a feeling and essentially our brain then down regulates production of our own endogenous cannabis like substances that bind to our own endogenous anandamide receptors, which is our cannabis receptors, such that we essentially go into like a deficit cannabis state. And then we have pain as a result of that neuroadaptation. And so it's very tricky. And that brings me to something else I wanted to touch on, because I think we see this in cannabis. Let's say that individual continues to use at relatively high levels, high concentrations, different types of products. I, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, or CHS. Could, could that be be, and I don't know the science of it, could that be an extreme example of the body going the opposite direction? So here we were using cannabis to help with nausea, to help with pain. Uh, But, you know, I work with people of CHS. I had the first stage of it, the nausea. Now it's doing the opposite. I'm not getting, now I'm in intense myalgia, intense muscle pain. Is that potentially an example of that playing out like in an extreme? Absolutely. And and that's sort of the natural history of drug use in general, whether it's opioids or cannabis or alcohol, whether we're using it for pain or sleep, depression, anxiety, that that very substance that initially helps us over time as our brain adapts to the substance, not only does it stop working, but it can actually turn on us and do the opposite of what we were using it for in the first place. So for example, I've seen many patients who have used cannabis for nausea and vomiting, 
initially it's like a miracle cure, but ultimately then leads to this vomiting syndrome. Same thing with anxiety. People who you know, say initially this worked great for me, now it makes me anxious and paranoid whenever I use it. What happened? And essentially it is this process of neuroadaptation, which brings us not just to our baseline level, but actually below baseline, where now the substance is, is doing the opposite of, of why we originally used it, which is why it's so important to educate people and to warn them about the potential consequences of long-term use while validating that initially it can feel like a miracle cure that for many people um, it ends up adding another new very serious problem. Let me emphasize that for reasons we don't understand, for some people they can go through this trajectory of neuroadaptation and then this opponent process mechanism where they get the opposite effect of what they were looking for in a matter of weeks. For other people it can take years or even decades. I have patients, for example, in their 70s who smoke pot for many, many years, never seem to develop any significant problems, but now in their 60s and 70s, terrible, terrible conditions. You know, it's not working. They can't get off. They've lost neuroplasticity because they're older, um, making them anxious, making them psychotic, making them feel more pain. So it's really important to recognize this early while you still have, have enough brain plasticity to reverse neuroadaptive effects. I think it is amazing that you said that. And people are fascinated. When I started uh, the awareness campaigns around cannabis and vaping and energy drinks, all addictions that we focus on, my target audience was a younger crowd. Most people who work with our offices are between the age of 40 and late 60s. That's who's calling us. Yes. And doc Dr. Lumpke, something uh, that I know I struggled with and that all of all the clients, people we've worked with struggle with. How was something that once was helping me beneficial? Here I am, I smoked weed for 10 years, never felt a problem. And then one day I woke up and it was like a light switch went off. And now it's suddenly the cause of all these problems. Um, that was so hard to wrap oh, my head around. Oh, I know, around. hard, really hard. Such a grief reaction, right? This thing that was your trusted coping mechanism, your best friend, all of a sudden it turns on you. It's so terrible. Yeah, and, and it might feel like it happens overnight, but actually it's not happening overnight. It's happening gradually. I'm not at all surprised that you, your demographic is primarily people 40 and older because what's happened is their brain is slowly changing. And then when they get to their 40s, that's when they realize, wow, this isn't working for me anymore. And it's in fact making me feel worse. What now? And that's when people often show up in our offices. So that when we have an opportunity to speak to people in their teens and 20s and even 30s, you know, one of my main missions is to educate them about what's coming down the road and to warn them and say, listen, while you're still young and have enough neuroplasticity to reverse these changes, you know, you need to do it. You don't want to wait till later. There's, there's always people in late in life can still, you know, reverse the changes, they can get into recovery, you know, it's still good, but oh my gosh, gosh so much better to do it earlier. Dr. Anna Lumpke, something that we've kind of been talking about has been, you know, okay, we've dispelled, yes, weed can be addicting, but a lot of people will say, well, you know what, it's just weed. It's not that serious of addiction, of an addiction. And we see this sometimes within even the recovery community. Someone may be coming off of another uh, opioid or other substance. Maybe weed has been part of their recovery process. We're very open to everything here in my work. So fine, great if it worked for them. Um, but then sometimes they'll attack the person that's coming off of weed and they'll say, that's not a real drug. That's ridiculous. And I've been subject to this, and I, I know from reading your book, and I know from watching you in other interviews, I think you might have gone through a little bit of this too at a time. Um, I've seen you talk about your struggles with what was, I believe, largely fantasy-related novels, yeah. and you talked about an addiction to those. And I've seen people kind of like smirk when they're interviewing you or this and that. But when I watched, I was like, no, no, no. I understand this can be serious. This is not a laughing matter. And I remember you talking about, you know, how it was interrupting family night life and even professionally in between patients. So how does someone quitting weed cope with that? How did you cope with that and become comfortable speaking about it? And how should someone else who's maybe having those same troubles quitting cannabis, like, what do they do? How do they face that? Yeah, you're highlighting a really um, interesting and important area of addiction medicine, which is that individual's um, impact from drug use 
versus what the cultural narrative is around that drug. And what's very clear with cannabis is that as the, as the public's perception of the risks associated with cannabis went down, that is to say, as, as people began to perceive um, cannabis as a safe drug, and even as a medicine, use went up. And we see that again and again. Uh, so as we sort of normalize use, as we medicalize use, more people use, um, and the kind of insight and reflections around potential harm um, are, are essentially corrupted to some extent uh, by these cultural narratives. Uh, I think the key, the key piece here, what we need to push back on is uh, that cannabis um, may be more subtle um, in its impact than, let's say, you know, somebody who's intoxicated with alcohol. And people with an alcohol intoxication are often highly disruptive, um, you know, engaging in uh, acute violence. Whereas because of the nature of cannabis, it tends to be sort of sedating or soporific, demotivational, although not always, because when people get psychotic and paranoid, obviously there are other risks. But, you know, in general, people are looking for those types of benefits. I think it's easy to say, well, this is a less harmful drug, right? Um, but uh, we have to measure harm, not just in terms of the acute effects, but also the long-term impact. And I think when I look at long-term, cannabis for me ranks up really high up there in terms of damaging and pernicious effects in a number of different ways. First of all, we've talked about this neuroadaptation that leads to it not working, but then the person is stuck on it because they're dependent and getting off is, is hard because they've developed uh, you know, this tolerance and dependence. Uh, but also cannabis has a really insidious way of demotivating people and making them less able or willing or wanting to engage in their lives and move forward uh, you know, in a kind of productive way and in a way also that's consistent with their values. It engenders a kind of apathy about existence in general, which I think can be very, very harmful, especially for young people, especially when you're looking again at the long view. Does that have to do with what's happening with dopamine? I believe I've heard you say that when we enter into a state of addiction, I was always under the impression I'm using a drug, I'm getting more dopamine, here we go, I'm getting ramped up. And it wasn't until I read your book that I realized, wait a minute, the more I was smoking weed, the more I was driving into the addiction, was my body and my brain actually entering a state of dopamine deficit? constantly? Like, was I putting myself? And is that lack of dopamine, because dopamine drives motivation, you've explained that so beautifully in your book. I hope everyone reads that. Uh, is, is that what, what happens? Is that what's happening with cannabis there? Yeah, what's essentially happening with cannabis and any other addiction is that our motivative, motivational systems get hijacked so that all we're motivated to do is to get our drug and use our drug. And motivations to do other things uh, lose priority. I mean, incredibly lose priority. And the way that that happens is, as you say, by driving us into this dopamine deficit state. In order to understand that, it's important to recognize that uh, pain and pleasure are co-located in the brain. So the same parts of the, of the brain that process pleasure also process pain. They work like opposite sides of the balance. And one of the rules governing this balance is that it wants to remain level. And with any deviation from a level balance or what neuroscientists call homeostasis, whether it's the side of pleasure or pain, our brains are going to work hard to restore that. And the way our brains do that is by tilting first an equal and opposite amount to whatever the initial stimulus was. So just to review that with cannabis, we use cannabis. It has all kinds of uh, effects on the brain, binding the anandamide receptors. But ultimately, as with all addictive substances, the final common pathway is that it releases a lot of dopamine in the reward pathway. Dopamine is our pleasure neurotransmitter and our balance tilts to the side of pleasure. But no sooner has that happened than the brain adapts. I like to imagine that as these neuroadaptation gremlins hopping on the pain side of the balance to bring it level again, but they like it there. So they stay on until the balance is tilted an equal and opposite amount to the side of pain. That's the come down, the after effect, the hangover. If we wait long enough without using, the gremlins hop off and homeostasis is restored. But if we continue to use our substance on a regular basis, basis, what happens is we start to accumulate more and more gremlins on the pain side of the balance in an effort to restore homeostasis. And we eventually get stuck there in a chronic dopamine deficit state with, you know, enough gremlins on the pain side to fill this whole room. And now we need to use our drug not to feel good, but just to level the balance and feel normal when we're not using 
Basically, we're experiencing the universal symptoms of withdrawal, which are primarily psychological, anxiety, irritability, dysphoria, craving. And we're very narrowly focused and motivated to just get our drug. We're not able to use our creativity, our libido, our self-expression to aim for any other reward. It's just like get cannabis, restore the balance. Now, you talk about in your book, when it comes to quitting cannabis, you touch on some, maybe I'll say recommendations under the the topic of dopamine fasting, being a potential way to start to restore this balance. And, you know, we'll throw out the disclaimer, this isn't medical advice. We're not telling people to jump on these things right away, read the book, draw your own conclusions. But what are some of these things? What What is the purpose of dopamine fasting? What's the role it plays in addiction recovery from cannabis? And if you could elaborate on maybe one or two tips in regard to dopamine fasting. Yeah. So the, the idea behind dopamine fasting is that recovery really needs to start with restoring that homeostasis between pleasure and pain. Because as long as we're walking around with that balance tilted to the side of pain, we're in a sub threshold or active state of craving, our entire life's energy is gonna be narrowly focused on just getting our drug to restore the balance. So by abstaining from our drug for long enough, what we do is we send a message ultimately to our brain that, hey, I'm not going to be getting dopamine anymore from this external substance. I need to start making my own dopamine again. And that happens gradually over days to weeks. On average, it takes about four weeks or 30 days on average to restore dopamine homeostasis, um, You know, which is why I usually ask people to do a dopamine fast of 30 days from their drug of choice. And in this case, cannabis. Im- importantly, you know, I don't necessarily ask people to give up all of their substances. Usually we're focused on the one thing that, that they're motivated to stop or that's most problematic in their lives. Sometimes people will give up all of their uh, dopamine inducing substances and behaviors at once. There are data suggesting that when people quit smoking and quit cigarettes at the same time, they have better outcomes. So I think that's reasonable, but usually that's overwhelming for people. We sort of focus on, okay, what's the one thing? And then essentially while they're, when they give it up initially with all those gremlins on the pain side, you know, they crash to the side of pain. They're going to experience withdrawal, anxiety, chronic, more pain, more physical pain. So I always warn my patients, you're going to feel worse before you feel better. But if you can just continue to abstain, eventually those neuroadaptation gremlins that have been camped out on the pain side of the balance will begin to hop off. And at about week three or four, you will feel much better, not just better than you did in the first two weeks, but actually better than you have probably in a really long time. And about 80, 80% of my patients who are willing and able to give up cannabis for four weeks have this experience. Initially, they feel terrible, anxious, depressed, sometimes hyperemesis, increased body pain. But if they can make it to 30 days, uh, they feel a heck of a lot better. And you know what I gathered from your book, and I'm sure it it varies from patient to patient, but the young lady that was uh, quitting cannabis in your book that you that you referenced, you you got her to four weeks, and a lot of it sounded like it was mostly related to talk therapy. Like unless you didn't disclose it in your book, it didn't sound like you said, "Okay, we're going to do a medication assisted quit." It sounds like you kind of said to her, "Hey, listen, we're going to." you broke down weed, you helped her realize that maybe it wasn't as beneficial. And then you just asked her to get to 30 days and let her draw her own conclusions. Is is that accurate? Was, or was there something like magical happening behind the scenes that I overlooked? No, I mean that, you know, I think there was, there wasn't really any magic anywhere. It was really just explaining to her. I mean, she, she was someone who came in a young woman who said she really, she wasn't looking for help with stopping cannabis. She was looking for help with anxiety. And, and when I found out that she was a daily heavy cannabis user, I just said to her, listen, uh, I think there's a really good chance that if you stop using cannabis, your anxiety could get a lot better without us having to do anything else. She was extremely skeptical. She said, no, you don't understand. Cannabis is the only thing that's helped my anxiety. I need now you to do something more than cannabis. You need to add to cannabis. I said, well, I hear you, you know, and I, I hear that subjectively it makes sense to you. Because when you smoke, you get some relief from anxiety. But probably what you're doing is not treating your underlying anxiety. You're just treating withdrawal from the last dose. So credit to her. She was willing to take the leap of faith, especially after I explained how the brain works, and to you know give it up for a month. And when she came back a month later, she was, she was stunned. She was like, I, 
She says, first of all, I realized, number one, that I was addicted to cannabis, something that she hadn't really thought she was. And what made her realize she was addicted was how hard it was to give up and how in the withdrawal process, she had a very prominent physical symptom of vomiting. So, right, the opposite, what we experience in withdrawal is usually the opposite of what we experience with intoxication or with use. So she was probably getting some emetic or vomiting suppression. Uh, not that she was using it for that purpose, but she was getting that from the cannabis. So when she stopped it, her body roared back, right, the opponent process, mm -hmm. and she had, a, she had a terrible vomiting syndrome for the first two weeks. That eventually quieted down. Um, as did her anxiety, which was much worse initially. And by week three or four, she had so much less anxiety than when she, and, and then she was able to have this kind of aha moment. It's like, oh, wow, you know, now looking back, I had thought that, you know, I started using cannabis for anxiety. Initially, it really did work. And this is really important to validate because when people have a kind of cause and effect observation in their own lives, very hard to say to convince them otherwise, right? They have their own lived experience of, no, I use cannabis and I felt better. So you're, I don't care what you say about cannabis, it works for me. That's why this, this dopamine fast, this abstinence trial is so important because it can get people to really rethink whether or not what was initially true about the effect of cannabis is still true about the effect of cannabis. That makes a lot of sense because then too, it's not you necessarily telling the person, hey, this is what happened. Yeah. They're realizing it on their own and suddenly the, the ball's in their court. You mentioned anxiety. People, I'm sure you see this all the time, addiction and trauma and PTSD and all of these things tend to go hand in hand, right? Like addiction seems to love trauma and PTSD and past experiences. I question though sometimes, is it, is there a way to separate or have you ever in clinical practice the trauma from the addiction or the PTSD from the addiction? Or do you always view these things as two things that always go hand in hand? And I only say that because I just, I, I just I'll say a personal experience thing. My family grew up, they had problems like other families did. And as long as I replayed that narrative in my mind, I always had a reason to go dra grab for the drug. I was like, well, parents are still divorced. They still fight. I'm still going to smoke weed. And then it wasn't until one day I was working with a, a therapist and she said, hey, I just want you to separate these two things. We're going to work on the, the trauma. Right. But then we're going to work on the addiction and we're just going to separate them. And she said, you know, I feel like that addiction is taking advantage of all the trauma that happened in your life. And I don't want to allow that to happen anymore. And for me, that was super powerful. Do you think there's any commentary on that at all? Oh, yeah, I have a, a, a lot of uh, commentary on that. So there are a lot of doorways into addiction. One of the doorways is trauma people who experience some kind of significant and overwhelming trauma may reach for a substance, a potentially addictive substance like cannabis in order to quote unquote, self-medicate that, that trauma. But what's not true about that self-medication narrative or, you know, uh, self trauma healing narrative is a, a couple things. Number one, uh, what's not true is that substances work to heal the trauma. They don't. And in fact, they put a block up, in our ability to heal from trauma or other psychiatric or emotional problems. Number two, what's not true about that is that it implies that addiction is only ever a secondary process and not its own, own primary progressive disease. And the truth is that although there are lots of risk factors for addiction, poverty, unemployment, um, uh, you know, co-occurring mental illness, um, trauma, uh, once people get into addiction, addiction is its own brain disease. It's got its own engine driving it. And if we don't focus on that and treat it, um, you know, we're, we're not going to solve the problem. It's a little bit like obesity and, and type 2 diabetes. You know, people who are obese are very likely to develop um, type 2 diabetes. If we just address the obesity problem, without also helping them with their acute sugar crisis, right? Um, we, we would not be doing them uh, uh, you know, a, a good service. Uh, the other thing too, is you, 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 know, you, you talk a little bit about like the narrative and, and the stories that we tell ourselves that kind of rationalize or justify our drug use. And I've seen that a lot with trauma narratives or victim narratives. 
um, which is not to invalidate people's experience of trauma, but just to say that when mo- what I've seen over the years and when people get into robust recovery, they stop blaming their life circumstances or other people on, you know, their, their, they stop blaming their addiction on life circumstances and other people. And they start, you know, saying, well, what, what can I do? You know, what, what am I responsible for? And that's usually a healing, a healing narrative. So I think it is really important for therapists as your therapist did to say, Hey, wait a minute, you know, there's probably some truth that your dysfunctional family of origin increased uh, your predilection for using cannabis and then getting addicted to cannabis, but your healing process, you're not doing any favors to your healing process by continuing to use that victim narrative as a way to rationalize what has become its own, you know, separate behavior. It was that conversation that I had with her that really put me in control. And for the first time, I felt like, wow, wait a second. I'm controlling these thoughts. I'm controlling what I allow to pass through my brain and not. So I I completely 100% agree with I think you hit the nail on the head something wrapping that up. Uh, Two last things here. So what I've really learned from your book and even more so in today's conversation is chasing pleasure might result in a lot more pain. Um, But what I want to ask you is this, and this was the first time, and I can't believe this is the first time I've heard this in your book. You have a point where you say, listen, I have days where I'm depressed. I have days where I'm anxious. I have days where I experience pain. So it would be, from what I gather, unrealistic to quit weed, quit any drug, and expect a life that's going to be pain-free and full of butterflies. And what I'm hearing you say, though, is that's okay. It's actually healthy to have some level of discomfort in life. Did I, did I interpret that correctly out of that? Yeah. I mean, I think what I was really trying to do in disclosing my own suffering was to really normalize it and say, hey, being a human being is hard, you know, and and when we stop numbing our brains and trying to escape the reality of being human, um, you know, what we're faced with is, is a difficult road. It's not as if, uh, you know, you stop using and, and you get into recovery or sobriety and then, you know, yay, you know, my life is so much better. I and mean, some people have that, but even when they have that, it, you know, it doesn't last that long, but, but ultimately it's still a better path. It's still a better path because you're showing up for your life. You know, you only get your life, right? And you're, you're called to do whatever you're called to do. And you can't show up for your life if, if you're running away from yourself with substances and other addictive behaviors. We've got to show up for our lives and to remind ourselves that for all of our suffering, we're not alone, right? It's much easier to tolerate our suffering when we know that others suffer too and we can help each other and struggle together. I mean, life is such an incredible, you know, awe-inspiring mystery. And I use that term awe not in the sense of like rainbows, but in the sense of, you know, kind of terror, right? Like what, the, what is this? It's a, you know, what are we doing? You know, our cosmos hurtling through space, the expanding, you know, gosh, get, you know, you, you think about it for too long and you're, you just, your mind starts to, you know, explode. Um, and there can be wonderful, joyful, incredible moments in life, but a lot of it is hard. And so, you know, how do we then, carry on. You know, and I, and I think the carrying on part is, is really the, the interesting part. That's something that I've, I think that's been the slowest growing part of the recovery, figuring it out, right? Each year, okay, here's this new challenge. Here's this new thing. Right. If I'm not going to pick up weed, how am I going to do this? How right. am I going to get through this? And you just keep learning, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, and, and, and stay patient, right? And stay humble and I think, you know, we, we underestimate the, the kinds of meaning that we can find um, by living according to our values, be, being of service, taking it a day at a time, all of that. I have one last question for you. And people ask me, they say, is there anything you still struggle with? And, you know, maybe someone could, they could ask you the same thing about the, uh, in regard to the romance novels. Is there anything it, that I still struggle with when it comes to cravings. And oh. my, my answer is widely no, but there is there is one thing. And every now and then I'll be leaving work, I'll do something really a big, a big, nice big accomplishment. And I go to that reward and I'm like, you know what? It'd be really nice to go smoke some weed and enjoy some nicotine right now. Go get, go get high and smoke a cigarette or chew some tobacco. Mm-hmm. And then I look around me 
And I say, everyone has a reward, Frank. This is what my brain will tell itself. I'll look at my, you know, my den- a neighbor, mine successful, whatever, so-and-so successful p- physician, and I'll see them outside, you know, maybe having a cigar, or I'll look at someone else in my mm. family and they're eating cake, or I'll look at, it doesn't matter who. And I'm like, well, everyone seems to have an addiction. Everyone seems to have a reward. And now that I've stripped myself or chosen to remove, I should say, rather weed, nicotine, energy drinks, I I can't, my body can't even tolerate caffeine if I wanted it. I, I do sometimes say, Frank, what's your reward at night? Like, and that feeling is something that I miss. And I get that a lot from people. So that's, I, I suppose, my kind of final question or topic that I just wanted to ask you about, because I know you've talked about this reward thing before. Yeah, so this is so interesting, and this gets into really deeper philosophical questions. Um, that's one of the hardest things about giving up our drug of choice. How do we then reward ourselves at the end of the day or after a job well done or even just a, a difficult period, right? How do we escape? How do we experience that that non-being? And so much of our culture bookends our, our entire lives with rewards, right? Uh, so much of our culture is all about, oh, when you do this, you can reward yourself with this. You can, and so we, we, we do that. We, and I, you know, our, 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 we're told that it's normal and it's good. What I like to do sometimes is a kind of a Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment, where I think about what if the world were devoid of any reward, that anything that I would find to be greatly pleasurable? What if there was no more romance novels, no more chocolate, no more movies, what if I went through this whole day, just think about it in terms of a single day, and I didn't anticipate any reward at the end of that day? It's a fascinating psychological shift that we have to go through when we do that, because all of a sudden, if I'm not looking forward to my reward, then I'm forced to be here in the moment. So, so for example, you and I talking together, there's a part of me that's going, uh, I'm going to be happy when this is over and I can drink my coffee, you know, whatever it is, or I can just not have to concentrate anymore and answer these questions. <laughs> but if I, if I flip, I enjoy you. It's great. Don't, don't take a person. <laughs> this is part of the good diet. But if I flip and I say, you know, what if there's no coffee at the end of our discussion? Or what if there's no break? All of a sudden I settle into my body. I settle into the moment. I settle in because it's just you and me. There isn't anything else. We're right here. You and I are it. We're it. How about that? That's a really different and interesting way to experience this interaction. And in a way, I relax. I kind of relax and uh, I'm fully present, you know, and and also like you are my, this is it. You're my source of joy. Um, So, you know, we we better make it work. That answered that question beautifully. It gave me goosebumps while you were talking about it because (laughs) my own wheels started spinning and I've kind of maybe started to develop that mentality, but you just closed up the loop for me on that. And I am beyond excited to start applying that. Again, it's a shift. You're talking about a shift in perception, uh, a shift in mindset, how you view this whole idea of reward. And that is like totally what I'm about on this channel. So that just has me smiling from ear to ear. I couldn't think of a more positive way to end this conversation than on that note. Um, Dr. Do you have anything else you would like to say regarding cannabis addiction or weed or relapse or just any other tips, advice, anything else that you'd like to end this conversation with? I just really appreciate you and your um, kind of providing this perspective, which I think is so needed when it comes to cannabis. I really appreciate that. And I'm excited for it. I tell people, look, whether you're pro-cannabis or anti-cannabis, education is the key. Uh, Mm -hmm. For those who are pro-cannabis, I don't think there's anything better than actually discussing the potential consequences or harms because that's how you avoid getting into trouble with it in in the future. So I really love doing, doing this. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking the time. You are very welcome.